Dear Father, thank you, Father, for a summer that gave us opportunities to relax and travel, perhaps, or be with friends, uh, enjoy the weather, uh, be outside, Father, all those great things you give us in the summertime. And then, Father, the change in seasons here is, is not as dramatic as it may be in other places, but we still see all the, the telltale signs of the year uh, turning to new things, Father, with school starting and, and other things around this time of year, Father, and in particular, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to gather again and study and to devote ourselves to something that has eternal value, eternal outcomes in our hearts and, and in those we might influence by what we learn. And so I ask, Father, as we start a study like this, that our mind would be directed not toward merely what's in the book, but also, Father, what's in our hearts that you want to change and that you want to develop. And perhaps, Father, what's in our walk ahead that depends so much on what we learn here that you called us here, that you wanted us here, Father. And so I ask that our, our hearts, Father, would be directed toward diligence and persistence in this effort, that our study, Father, wouldn't be seen merely as an event, but as eternal preparation for something important that you have planned, and, and that we would approach it from that mindset. Help us to have the stamina and the opportunity to be a part of this, all the way to the conclusion, Father. And then, Lord, give us hearts and ears that are open and ready to learn. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ is our suffering prophet, our high priest, and our righteous king, and he is the judge of all creation. Prophet, priest, king, and judge. Sinful mankind requires that we have someone to assume all those roles so that we can know and serve and enjoy God the Father. We need a prophet because someone has to explain the Father to us. We need a judge because we need to be convicted of unrighteousness if it's ever going to change. We need a high priest to intercede for our sins, all those sins that we've been convicted of. And we need a king who will lead us into righteousness ultimately. And in the Old Testament, the Lord gave Israel each of those roles in their respective communities. There were prophets sent to the people of Israel. There were priests appointed to serve in the tabernacle. There were judges that ruled over the people for a time. And ultimately, there were kings who ruled in the nation. But in every case of those four, you'll find in Scripture this clear demonstration that human actors were never going to be sufficient to meet the needs of the people in any of those four roles. Because judges, for example, would fail to stem the tide of sin among the people. The book of Judges teaches us that. And prophets, they were usually ignored. They're almost always murdered for what they would tell the people. Priests become corrupt and self-serving. Kings turn tyrannical and despotic. And as a result, Jewish society remained far from the God who called them into the covenant, despite having the services of those four institutions. Like all men, Israel needed a savior who could serve and save mankind in each of these roles. The books of Samuel tell the story of the rise of Israel's kings in this Old Testament saga. And our study of 1 Samuel is actually the study of the first half of a single work that was originally written called Samuel. And just like the books of Kings, for example, and Chronicles, this book originally was one, was later divided for convenience. So prior to the Septuagint, you had 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel in one work in the Jewish Bible. After the Septuagint, the Jews had divided it into two. The earliest parts of this combo book were written by Samuel, probably. But at a point in this story, he is gone and the story continues on without him. So the later would have been finished by other prophets, probably Gad or Nathan, who were following Samuel. So the first seven chapters of 1 Samuel overlap with the final period of the book of Judges, as I mentioned a moment ago. And so in, during these first chapters of the book, a couple of them which we study tonight, Samson is the judge of Israel at this time, at the time Samuel is born. And so Samuel becomes a contemporary with Samson, although a younger one, of course. Then at Samson's death, Samuel begins to judge Israel. Eventually, Israel demands a king, as you know, and that's really where this story is headed. By chapter 8, we've got Israel saying we want a king. And then from chapter 8 to 31, which is the rest of the book of our first Samuel study, we're going to trace the reign of Israel's first king, Saul, who was a man after the people's heart. Midway through that book, though, we're going to be introduced to Saul's successor, even before he takes the throne, that is David, of course, who is a man after God's heart. So both Saul and David reign for 40 years, as does Eli, as does Samuel. And in this transition period of the second half of the book of 1 Samuel, you're going to see the rivalry that develops 
and the message that comes out of this rivalry. A good part of the book of Psalms was written during the second half of 1 Samuel as David is out in the desert. So there's a lot going on in this book, a lot of overlap, a period of transition in the history of Israel. There are several notable themes that we're going to pay attention to as we go. I'm not going to really touch on this very long tonight. It'll come up as we move through it. But it's important to at least highlight a couple, I think. Uh, Key among them is the sovereignty of God. And you're going to hear me nailing on this one frequently through the book. The sovereignty of God is front and center in this book. Even as the people of Israel reject the judge and they demand a king, you're going to see the Lord remaining very much ruling over his people, despite all that's happening on the ground. And he brings them a king to satisfy their fleshly desires for status and for ego and for image, but only to show them the folly of their ways, ultimately to bring them a better king in due time. And quickly, the people are going to see the folly of Saul. So having made that point, he'll elevate his successor. As you know, David, the new man will one day become king. By the time you get to Second Samuel, he's on the throne, but not before the Lord allows Saul to see his life play out in this particular way, even as he tries to destroy David, the one that the Lord has anointed. All of this is an opportunity to teach a story and, as you know, to give David an opportunity to write most of the Psalms. There's a layering of purpose, all of it under God's sovereignty, but at the surface, the story reads very much like a soap opera, really, of characters who are self-absorbed and conspiratorial and egotistical and the underdog and the, the despot and so on. All of these threads from a human level, just seem like ordinary, everyday, sinful humanity. But God is orchestrating a bigger picture through all of them. The sovereignty of God is right there on display. The whole story forms a picture of the suffering Messiah awaiting to enter into his kingdom through David. Finally, the books of Samuel reinforce the superiority of God's word as spoken through the prophets. This is a second major theme. The superiority of God's word as spoken through prophets. During the time of the patriarchs and the time of judges, the Lord spoke to people through their leaders, through the patriarchs and then later through the judges. So the role of leader and prophet were inseparable. There was no distinction. But once kings arrived, particularly Saul, of course, and then afterward, God only revealed himself through prophets from that point forward. The king never had the word of God given through him, beginning with Samuel, who was the first prophet of the Old Testament, Though, of course, men like Abraham and and the judges were producing the word of God. But when you think of the pure role of prophet apart from leader, Samuel's the first one. So kings would lead, but even the kings had to go to prophets to find out the word of God. That was a change. That demonstrated that God's word is the highest authority in God's creation, even above human kings, even above human leaders. And that's why God separates them. It's one of the reasons he separates them at this point. So those are just two of the things. We could go on all night with those, but we're going to stop. Before we get to all of that, let's just dive into chapter 1 and into Samuel's background story and see where this takes us for tonight. Chapter 1, and I'll read verses 1 through 11 to begin. Now, there was a certain man from Ramathaim, Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroma, the son of Elihu, the son of Tehu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. And the name of the other was Penana. Penana had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penana, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. It happened year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat and why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now, Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. Well, those are the opening verses of the story of Samuel, perhaps familiar to most of us if we've ever read it or heard it. Samuel is a man born to a man named Elkanah. 
He's described here as a certain man in these opening verses. In other words, his identity doesn't really matter, except, of course, for his relationship to Samuel, who's the character that we're concerned with here, the main story, the main character in the story at this point. Elkanah lived about five miles north of Jerusalem in Ramah, so very close to the city of Jerusalem. He was a Levite by birth, according to 1 Chronicles 6, so that means he's a priest or of a priestly tribe. But he's living in a small town in central Ephraim. He's not living in a Levite town, as he should. Well, that would be our first clue that this guy isn't focused on obeying the Lord. So Samuel's father is not exactly the ideal role model. Nevertheless, in verse 3, we hear he does go annually to worship in Shiloh. Shiloh is the location of the tabernacle during this time, during the years from Joshua all the way until David, when he moved it to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was an unconquered Jebusite city in these days, and it remained so until David conquered it. Elkanah also practices bigamy, as you can see, which has always been contrary to God's design for marriage. This is the second clue that Elkanah is not a particularly godly man. His two wives are Hannah and Penina, or Penina. From Penana, he received many sons and daughters, we're told, but Hannah was barren. And so the prospect of Hannah ever having children would appear to be very remote at this point. And the Lord has withheld her from having children for many years, it seems. The Lord withholds the giving of children to women in Scripture from time to time. Hannah reminds us of women like Sarah, like Rebecca. Those are two women who also could only have a child if the Lord performed a miracle. However, I want to suggest to you that you should look at the story a little differently than that. It's not that God had to do a miracle in order for them to have children. You need to understand the circumstances from the opposite perspective. Those women could not have children in the first place because God was not allowing them to have children. Because when he did finally relent and bring them the child they wanted, the arrival of that child would be pregnant with meaning. So the arrival of the child is the point. By delaying it, now that begs the question. Why does God want this child to come now? The arrival of Hannah's first child is going to be such a moment. It's a special moment marked in God's plan. In verse 4, we learn that Elkanah was a decent provider for his family, and that included always giving his wives and children what their allotted portions were. But in sympathy and in love to Hannah, he always gave her the double portion, which, much like Hagar and Sarah, created this tension within the marriage. So Panana resented her husband's favoritism directed toward Hannah, which then led Panana to mock and torment Hannah over her lack of children, because to be childless in this time of, of history was the height of dishonor for any woman. And Panana turned that like a knife into Hannah's side every time it came up. So here's another example that reminds us of why the Bible looks negatively upon a man taking multiple wives. Anytime you see this in Scripture, the circumstances of the lives of those people, particularly of the women or, uh, or the husband himself, always reflects the mistake of that choice. In other words, it does not require the Bible spell out multiple wives is bad. That should be clear enough from Genesis 2. But if you couldn't have figured that out, just look at the circumstances of what you see in, in those situations. You'll see the sin play out as jealousy, bitterness, rivalry among the wives. Uh, you'll see the man showing favoritism to one over the other. And all of this is completely logical when you consider that a man's affections were always intended to be for one wife only and vice versa. So when you naturally violate that, you put yourself in a position of sin. That's going to bring negative consequences. And there's others I haven't even mentioned. So here you see one more example. So Hannah, we're told, is a devout and by all accounts here, godly woman. We're told she goes regularly up to the tabernacle in Shiloh to seek the Lord's mercy for her barrenness. But every time she goes to the tabernacle and pray, then she's mocked by her sister wife. Hannah would weep, we're told. She would fast, hoping to receive a positive response from the Lord. And then she'd be mocked. What Penina is mocking is Hannah's hope in the Lord. Hannah's persistent hope in the possibility that the Lord would grant her a child despite years of having not received that child to this point. And that persistent hope is clear evidence of Hannah's faith in God's promises. Even as Penina's mocking would suggest that she is not a God-fearing woman. And then, of course, you have her husband, who is not apparently the most sensitive sort. He dismisses her misery when she is crying at the temple and does it in a pretty, I think, cold, uncaring way. He first says, why are you so upset and why are you weeping so much? And then he flippantly says, isn't having me better than having ten sons? Which is the natural thing any husband would ask of, her, of, of his wife. Why would a wife need anything beyond us? 
So not only is she mocked by her sister wife, she's mocked in a sense, even if it's inadvertent, by the husband. And all Hannah has at this point in the story is her faith in the Lord and in his mercy. And you can just see how godly this woman is when you read the first part of verse 9. Her husband tells her in, in this mocking, in this self-serving way, he says, get up from your weeping and fasting because I'm enough for you. And she does it. She does exactly what her husband instructs her to do. I seriously doubt she felt like doing what he asked her to do, but she obeyed her husband's request nonetheless. Everything about this woman's life testifies to her godliness, even her name, which means grace. Meanwhile, in verse 9, we learn that the priest at the tabernacle, the chief priest, was a man named Eli. Now, he's not mentioned in the book of Judges, but you find out later in this book that he judged Israel for 40 years before Samson became a judge. When Hannah returned to the temple on another day to pray and weep again, Eli's there, as we're told, and he observes her. And this time as she's praying, Hannah is moved to make this vow, which we just read. And the vow is in hopes that she would finally receive the child that she desperately wanted. So, in effect, she's bargaining with the Lord. She's making a deal. She says, if you give me the son, then the son you give me would be dedicated to serving you from birth. And moreover, she says he'll be raised a Nazarite. And that's the meaning of not cutting his hair. A Nazarite was a man who took a vow to be dedicated to the Lord. And then as evidence of that vow, he just wouldn't cut his hair. By the way, as a small little aside, all of the pictures of Jesus, the movies, you know, the blue eyed English guy uh, with the accent, they all have long hair. Very uncharacteristic, very unlikely. Remember, to not cut your hair meant you had taken a Nazarite vow. So if everyone wore long hair, you wouldn't know who the Nazarites were. It's much more the case that they would cut their hair, much like men do now. Paul even makes that point in First Corinthians when he says it's to the honor that a woman has long hair and a man keeps his hair short. So this idea that they all look like 1960s hippies is completely modern in its in its origins. Jesus would have had hair much like mine, I assume. <laughs> But think about the vow she's just made. She is essentially bargaining away the companionship that she so desperately wants in her son. Because from an early age, her son is going to be in the company of the priests, learning the law, serving in the tabernacle. He's basically going to become a ward of the tabernacle. But she wants the child. And so that gives you an understanding of the serious sacrifice that she's making here, trading away the very thing she seems to want so much. But in reality, what she really wants, even more than she wants the companionship of this son, is the honor of the Lord's favor. It was understood in that day that if you were a woman and you were barren, that you had been made barren by the will of God. That was a, a common perception, and for that matter, it's a true perception, ultimately. It wasn't bad luck, it wasn't DNA, it wasn't chance, and by the way, conveniently, it's never the man's fault. It would have been always seen as a purposeful act of a sovereign God against that particular woman. And therefore, a barren woman was viewed in her circumstances as a woman from which the Lord is withholding his favor, withholding his honor and grace. That's why Hannah's prayer was to receive the favor, the honor of the Lord. And then it would explain her willingness to bargain away the very thing she requested. This, too, I would argue, is evidence for her faith. For she believed that the barrenness she had was of the Lord's doing. And then she understood, I assume, that if the Lord were to grant her petition, if there were to be a day that he would actually give her the child he asked for, he would only do so seeming to change his mind because there was some very specific purpose in his mind for reversing the situation. That he wouldn't have done it merely casually because then it would make him appear capricious from the whole of it. But rather he had a purpose. Therefore, she must have concluded that any such child, were he to arrive, must have a special future in God's plan. And therefore, she's not actually losing anything in acknowledging the obvious. She's just giving back to what belonged to God in the first place. But in the process, were she to receive a son, she would still gain greatly because she would be vindicated before her enemies, which is her primary concern. Not that she doesn't desire a son, but willing to give it up to gain what she really cared for in this case. So she makes this, this request. And as you noted in the text, Eli watches. And then we move on. Verse 12. Now it came about as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart. Only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, how long will you make yourself drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah replied, no, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, 
But I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. Oh, then Eli answered and said, well, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad. So as all this was taking place, as you heard, the, the priest, Eli, is observing Hannah praying. And in this time of history, culturally, public prayer was not silent. It was always out loud. So people would pray out loud And if you've ever seen the Wailing Wall, for example, in Israel, typically the Jewish observers there, the Jewish participants there are making noise. They're talking out loud, maybe not very loud, but you can hear them, though much of that is silent because you have people mixing from different cultures. It's typical in that culture today, but it's very typical back in this day. And part of that, I think, is this sense of venting, of taking your burdens to the Lord and venting to the guy in charge and expecting him to hear you. So it was convention. But for whatever reason, Hannah is not praying out loud at this point, which is unusual, though her lips were moving. So Eli makes a conclusion, obviously a a bad assumption. He assumes she's drunk and then he chastises her for it. And then she naturally defends herself. In verse 15, she says she is suffering in her spirit. And then she uses this beautiful turn of phrase. She says she hasn't taken in strong drink. She has poured out her spirit before the Lord, a very eloquent way to reverse the thinking. And then in verse 16, she says she's been doing this for some time. But do you notice she never mentions what the topic is? She never mentions the subject that she's concerned about, who's tormenting her, etc. She never mentions the vow. All she says is, I've got good reason. And then Eli, I assume, must have realized he was wrong from about the very moment she began to talk because she spoke so eloquently. She was in control of her senses. There's no sense she's actually drunk. So he quickly backs down. He tells her to go in peace. But then he adds, may the Lord grant this petition. Now, that encounter may seem you know, somewhat comical or more or less innocent to us. But this meant a lot to Hannah. Think about it. You have the high priest and judge of Israel taking notice of her during prayer, which was highly improbable. I mean, this is a man of such power and importance in Israel. He would probably not take particular note of anybody who was praying at the tabernacle in this one moment, much less a woman, by the way, culturally. And then you had the interest to even speak to her as a woman. Again, a very unlikely scenario. So for him to pronounce a blessing upon her prayer request, to effectively back up her prayer request with his own, that she would see something grand, that's like hitting the lottery for Hannah in this moment. And remember, in this day, Eli was priest, judge, and prophet for Israel. He was the man through whom the Lord spoke to Israel. And the prophet of Israel, therefore, just said, the Lord will grant this petition for you. And I'm not saying that he made it so by his own whim. I would argue that the spirit of the Lord spoke through him so that he would make this clear. And that's why Hannah heard this blessing as a confirmation from the Lord. From her perspective, the Lord just said, I'm now going to honor your request. Notice in verse 18, she breaks her fast. Verse 18 says she's also no longer sad. This is a woman operating with a new outlook based on the words of Eli, as she assumes they are from the Lord. And her willingness to take his word in the moment is further proof that she's operating in faith. From beginning to end, she is operating in faith. She put her request before the Lord in faith. Now in faith, she receives a word from the Lord and she rests in that word. A lot of us would get that word and then go back and double down. One more prayer, one more weeping, one more day of fasting. Let's just close the deal. She heard enough with one word to be ready that God was there to answer her prayer. Now the question is, is she going to keep the vow concerning her son? Verse 19. Then they arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. It came about in due time after Hannah conceived that she gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel, saying, because I've asked him of the Lord. Then the man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the Lord remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. So they go back to Ramah, they return to regular life. In the course of events, as you heard, Hannah becomes pregnant. 
At this point, the miracle of the conception would have only served to strengthen her confidence and her faith in what God had underway. Right. She may have heard the word, but there was a period there between the moment she heard and the moment she conceived. And so there was some time for her to reconsider. Did God really do this? Is this really happening? But at the first indication she has this child, that would have no doubt been a moment of joy, of confirmation that the Lord had, in fact, answered. So whatever doubt she had at that point would have been wiped away. The Lord works in a very similar way in all our lives so that even when we believe and hope for the Lord in the answer to something, the Lord commonly gives us encouragement along the way in this path so that we have good reason to continue investing our faith in him. And he'll usually move in our lives and by means of a series of small steps. I've seen this quite often in my own life, and so I know it personally. You see it reflected in Scripture time and time again. Here's one of those examples. With each step, the Lord will ask us to persist in our belief and trust him for the rest of the plan. But as the Lord comes through in each of those steps, his faithfulness just serves as an encourager for us to continue down that path. So in in Hannah's case, for example, each step she took here is rewarded in some small measure by the Lord showing up, moving her back to a position of faith. And then there was a time where she had to exercise that faith again for the next stop of encouragement. And I think usually the Lord moves in our lives by means of this manner of small steps. Each step is towards some larger goal. Think about Hannah again. Even after her husband and his other wife mocked her, she had to maintain her determination to go back to the temple and continue to pray or the moment with Eli never takes place. And though he ordered her to leave the temple, she had to return on another day. And the Lord will do, I think, similar things in our life. He never asks us for more than we're capable of in terms of these short moments or periods of faith. And he will reward us ultimately in the way he encourages us onward in that way. He'll show up in some way, just like he did with Eli here, to encourage her for a time. Then the conception to encourage her for obviously a time. And then there'll be another step. But here's the catch. You never reach the end of that path that the Lord has prepared if you give up at any point along that way. So often you think of a walk of faith, I think, as an all or nothing proposition. We talk in those terms sometimes. Somebody is walking with the Lord. Someone is not walking with the Lord. That's some, sometimes the way we describe it. If we're speaking of someone who's not a believer, then sure, we can say they are either in or they are out. There is a not absolute there. But for the one who is a believer, the walk of faith is truly a matter of degrees in my experience. We experience more and more of what he means when he says walk with me as we follow him in those small steps as he helps us along that path. And if at any point along that path we decide we're not up for the trip, then we've walked to a point and we stall. But I don't believe he stops trying. He's, un- he's faithful even when we're faithless. So the walk is a matter of fits and spurts. It's not so much a matter of not walking at all. Then in verse 20, we hear Samuel is born, which clearly would have been the climactic moment in this walk, in this particular request. The name Samuel, it's not clear what it's meaning. It probably means something like heard of God or God hears, given what she said. He is Hannah's only son, certainly to this point, and yet she's going to give him up as promised. And when Samuel is born, we're told the father prepares to take a trip to the tabernacle in Shiloh to, among other things, pay his vow. And what he's referring to is in Leviticus 27, it says that the law requires that when a person makes a vow to the Lord, then the vow must be accompanied by an offering, by a payment. That rule has a parallel, by the way, in modern contract law. Because you cannot have a valid contract without payment of consideration. So this is a vow that needs to be accompanied by a payment. And here you see Elkanah going up to pay the vow. In fact, it's called Elkanah's vow. And the reason is because Hannah's vow became her husband's vow once he heard of the decision and didn't challenge it. Once he accepts it, he owns it. So Elkanah is obligated to pay the offering associated with what his wife has vowed. He asks Hannah, you going to come with us? She declines to accompany her husband to the tabernacle. First of all, she's not required to make the trip. So this is nothing wrong with her saying no. But secondly, she says she won't go now because she would have to have taken her infant son with her. If she was to go, he isn't weaned. She's going to have to carry him there. So she would be traveling with him. And she's so committed to her vow that she won't bring him near the tabernacle until she's ready to leave him. 
at the tabernacle. Clearly, she's not going back on her vow to the Lord. Right. And I think there's some wisdom in this. Imagine if she would have taken every trip to the tabernacle that would have been expected in the course of a normal feast year and done that over the years it took to wean her son. She would have had this going and leaving, going and leaving, going and leaving with her son experience that begins to put in your mind this thought that I'm not sure I want to leave him ever. She is so committed that she's not giving her flesh any room to tempt her otherwise. I'm going to stay here with my son, and then when I go, I'm leaving him. Again, a woman who's operating in such faith that she knows her own nature well enough to self-discipline herself to the vow she made. She says she's going to keep the boy only long enough to wean him. Now, we hear that, and we think 8, 10, 12, 13, 15 months. I don't know what's typical in your family. But this length of time was considerably more heartbreaking for Hannah than it would have been for us. In ancient times, traditionally, weaning took place at the age of five. That's when Isaac was weaned, for example. It would have been difficult, of course, for any mother to give up their child. But can you imagine a woman giving up her five-year-old son, a son that walks, talks, knows the family, and so on? I have to imagine she was preparing his heart through those years, even for this coming day. Otherwise, it would have been a great shock for him. But still, no small sacrifice for the mother. Verse 24. Now, when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three year old bull and one half of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. She said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord for this boy. I prayed and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. So she knew this day would come. And as promised, she brought Samuel to the Lord. She brought a significant thanks offering here with the boy. When you count what she gave, a bull, very expensive, a large quantity of flour and wine, not cheap. So the value of what she brings here as a thanks offering is evidence of her great thankfulness to the Lord. Again, you could preach probably a Sunday or two on how our showing of thanks should be commensurate with the degree of our thanks. She's certainly giving that here. And as she performed the sacrifice, she presents her son to Eli. Now, he may have recognized the mother, of course, but I doubt he was fully prepared for what she was going to do. So he's surprised to just have this boy thrust into his arms. And after reminding Eli of who she was, she says, this is now yours. He's a ward of the tabernacle now. The Lord is giving me an answer to my prayer. I promised you now have him. And it's time for her to make good on the vow. Notice in verse 28, she declares that Samuel will be dedicated to the Lord. And the word dedicated in Hebrew, it conveys the idea of giving something completely to the Lord, like giving up something in its entirety to the Lord. That's the sense of the word. In other words, she's holding nothing back. And because she's willing to give up her only son, Israel gains a prophet and a kingmaker. There's an obvious picture of Christ in her actions in the way that a son can be given up for the good of Israel and for the sake of creating a king. Samuel is the first and one of the most important prophets of the Old Testament, arguably. Not only did he write major books uh, of the Bible that go by his name, at least part of them, he also wrote Ruth, he also wrote Judges, perhaps other books. This man has been a gift to Israel, given by Hannah, and ultimately to all humanity who know the Lord. And she made him a gift out of her self-sacrificial perspective. So her choice to give up Samuel is a beautiful example of how God's children should respond to the Lord's gifts to us. Whenever the Lord has given us, whatever he has given us should be made available for the use of the Lord in whatever way he would choose. Paul tells us to make our lives a living sacrifice. And that's what this looks like. Holding nothing back, giving him our all. When you do that, when you take those things you treasure that he's given and you give them back in some sense, He can take those sacrifices and he can make them all the more powerful in their usefulness than we could ever make them by keeping them ourselves. And Samuel's just a great picture of that. Notice at the end of verse 28, we're told he worshiped the Lord, that he is a reference to Samuel. So Samuel begins worshiping the Lord right from the start of his time in Eli's family. And if you wonder how Hannah could leave her young son in the hands of a man like Eli, considering he's not going to be the best father you'll find later, she's not entrusting Samuel to Eli. She's placing Samuel in the care of the Lord. The Lord is going to raise this boy. Eli just happens to be his proxy. And her logic must have been something like this. If the Lord opened my womb to give me Samuel, 
then the Lord has a specific plan for Samuel in God's purposes. Therefore, I can trust the Lord to care for Samuel, even through the hands of a man like Eli. And in doing so, she shows the full impact of living with a trust in God's sovereignty. And we talk a lot about God's sovereignty. Of course, we can acknowledge it. We all think we understand it to some degree. But you have to learn to act with a trust that's commensurate with that belief in God's sovereignty. I find a lot of Christians, myself included, acknowledge his sovereignty in one moment and then very quickly turn around and figure out what are we going to do to solve this problem and, you know, we've got to make it happen. Do you trust the Lord to take care of your kids? That's a good test. I know a lot of families struggle with kids that have gone overseas in mission work into dangerous places. And you know what? There's your first test of whether you trust the Lord in his sovereignty. They've either been called into that work or they haven't. But if they have been called, then you have nothing to worry about. And that doesn't mean they're not going to be hurt. It just means you have nothing to worry about. Whatever comes is comes in God's providence and there'll be some eternal purpose in it and some eternal reward to be found in their obedience. In fact, the story of Eli and his sons, which we'll get to in coming weeks, makes clear that God's will is responsible for the outcome of every person's life. Because as you're going to see in this story, this father raises two really, really awful sons, but he also raises Samuel. What's the difference? Well, God had a purpose in that difference. And the Lord's will will bring blessings in that example for obedience, but it will also bring consequences for disobedience. Regardless of whether we obey or not, though, the Lord's will will be done. So after this dedication, we're going to do just her song in chapter two tonight to, to wrap up. Her song praises the Lord. It's recorded in the first part of chapter two. This song is very important. It's important in several ways. One of the clues for us in understanding its importance comes in the fact that it is mirrored very closely with another song that appears at the very end of Second Samuel, written by David. They're almost identical in theme as you run through them. And as such, they serve as bookends to the whole book of Samuel, essentially the roadmap for understanding the whole book. So let's read the song, verses 1 through 11. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren give birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he sets the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered against them. He will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went to his home in Ramah, but the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. Can you imagine this song being sung right to Penina's face? It has that sense almost of <laughs> boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth and so on and so forth. Now, it probably was not sung directly to her, but I feel better when I read it thinking that. And as I mentioned, it's a close match to what David sings at the end of Second Samuel. Both of those songs begin with a reference to the strength of the Lord as a horn and a rock. Both speak of a deliverer and salvation. Both end with a mention of his anointed. These two songs, as I said, serve as bookends teaching similar lessons about the Lord. And as that roadmap, as I mentioned, Hannah starts hers by declaring she can speak boldly. She can find strength in the face of her enemies. Why? Because she finds her joy in the salvation that the Lord brings. And in verse 2, she echoes that there is no other rock, no other God besides the Lord. Now, when you remember that the Lord is seated on his throne, then you cease your boasting and you take comfort in your afflictions because you realize there is no, there is no one else controlling the circumstance but him. His reign is never not in effect over his creation. So that when things seem to be going against us, and the world is falling apart, we can safely say the Lord is orchestrating those very events. And therefore, an understanding of God's sovereignty in everyday events is the single most powerful spiritual insight any Christian can obtain, in my opinion. It sets everything else in your life in its proper perspective. When you can say confidently, there is nothing happening right now that God doesn't want to have happen, and of course we know his character to be good, 
then though we can't see it in the moment, nonetheless, we can rest knowing there's something good coming from all of these circumstances. And it takes the fear and worry away, which I think is the basis for Jesus saying, do not worry, because who can add a day to their life with worry? It doesn't serve any purpose. By its very nature, it indicts God's character or his sovereignty, one or the other. So Hannah has declared up front, the sovereignty of God reigns. Next, Hannah declares that the Lord is a God of knowledge. Verse 3. I love this line. He weighs every action. He weighs every action he takes. And therefore, he would be saying everything he does has purpose. Everything he does has meaning. Every consequence that will fall from everything that he does is known and incorporated into the plan. He weighs everything he does. And the consequences of his action being well considered mean we can trust in them as well. Another way to say this, there's no plan B with God. Keep in mind that the fact that God has weighed all of the actions that he takes and knows all the consequences never absolves any human of their own sin in the sense that we can blame God for what we did or how it worked out. But nonetheless, even with our sin included in that formula, God is completely aware of where it's headed and makes it a part of his plan. Therefore, Hannah's many years of waiting factored into God's plan. That's the conclusion that she's drawing out of the first part of her song. Here I am with a son now, finally, and I'm giving him up. And that's vindication for me. But where was God all those other years? Well, there was a plan. Samuel was to be born, but not a day too soon. And therefore, Hannah's years of mocking and waiting were not wasted. They were not futile. They were not God forgetting her or God being unfair. God was not slow or uncaring. There's a purpose in it. And it's very easy, relatively speaking, to see that from the other side of the blessing much harder to see it before the baby shows up and to convince yourself that the waiting has purpose. So if you're one of those people who may in some context be in a situation where there's waiting taking place and a concern over why am I still waiting, you have to understand that at some point you may have that insight. Certainly by heaven, we we would assume we will. But that doesn't mean that in the meantime, there isn't good purpose in the waiting. I find too many people who are too busy trying to get to the end that they miss the good things that come out of the waiting. I like to say ministry is what you do while you're waiting for your next mission trip. And a lot of us see what we do in that sense, a moment that's coming as opposed to the moment that we're in. And the best work God has ever done in my heart has been in those times in which I'm waiting for him to do the thing I think needs to happen. Furthermore, the Lord places his strength not on the side of the mighty, but on the side of the weak. There's a phrase people throw around that people often claim it's in the Bible, that the Lord helps those who help themselves. Of course, that statement is not in the Bible. But more importantly, that concept is not biblical. The very idea of it is wrong. The Lord is not, according to this and elsewhere in Scripture, not inclined to help those who help themselves. If you help yourself, he's just going to let you do it for a while until you realize you can't get very far in your own strength. He is inclined, Scripture says, to help those who confess they cannot help themselves and therefore appeal to him for the very help they need. And the Lord delights to assist these people who gird themselves with his strength, Hannah says. And then in verse five, Hannah points out the foolishness of those who already have plenty. This is all to the point of of working in your own strength. Those who already have plenty and yet hire themselves out for work to gain even more. So they have plenty, but they're working for more. It's foolish because it represents a waste of time and energy and a lost cause in the end, because all that stuff burns up. Meanwhile, she says, those who are hungry are fed by the Lord and those who have many children Still languish because their children aren't even a comfort to them. While the barren woman is blessed with seven children she never expected. In other words, the world is busy working to obtain the very things that the Lord is prepared to grant to those who seek him. As Jesus said in Matthew 6.31, Do not worry, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear for clothing. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. Not necessarily in abundance of riches, but enough. And that's the point. So the Lord helps those who cannot help themselves and acknowledge it. And none of us can truly help ourselves, though sometimes we make the mistake of thinking we can. And then we run the risk of spending our time on the wrong things while missing the chance to see the Lord bless us in our dependence. That's something I've heard from time to time from those who live in full time mission work, that they never really got the blessing of seeing the Lord support them until they were in a position of utter dependence on the Lord. And then when he shows up, that recurring miracle of God providing and God providing was such a blessing in their life and something they didn't experience when they were working in some other context and took for granted that paycheck every week. So the first part of the song sets up 
The Lord is our strength. The Lord is the rock. The Lord has the knowledge to time all these events. It's his sovereignty guiding the course of events. But more than that, he has a program when he puts his sovereignty to work. And that program is to the defense of the needy and to the frustration of the proud to make the point that his strength is the way to any blessing. And then she says, the Lord brings both life and death as he sees fit. He has determined the destination of all men's souls, whether hell or heaven. He has set the station of our lives. Some people will be poor in this life. Some people will be rich, all according to God's will. But the Lord creates the poor and the needy, Anna says, so that he can show himself strong and compassionate as he raises them up. And the Lord has the power to raise up the poorest and place them at the table of kings. Prophetically, she's alluding to shepherd boys becoming kings here. For the Lord is in control of all men's lives and delights to show his power as he moves men like pieces on a chessboard into their respective places. And then in verse nine, she moves finally into the questions of God's grace in the lives of men. He says the Lord, she says the Lord is working to keep the feet of his godly ones. And godly here just refers to those who by faith have been saved and made children of God. And the Lord keeps those so that they remain his forever. But those who are wicked, which, of course, would be all who do not know the Messiah, then they will be silenced in darkness of hell. So the plan God has offered for our salvation works this way to preclude anyone from pointing to their own strength as a means of their salvation. She says no man will prevail by his own arm, his own strength. Not even kings who attempt to rule in their own power are going to prevail in that power, which, of course, is an allusion to Saul. Instead, those who prevail will do so by the strength of the Lord, which will be David in the desert. And that strength is found ultimately in the anointed one sent on our behalf. Verse 10, she ends by declaring the coming Messiah as king. And the Lord will judge the earth and give strength to his king. and The anointed one will be exalted. So as you look at this psalm or this, this song, it forms a loose outline of the books of Samuel, both of them. We're going to refer back to it from time to time as we study the rest of the book, because you're seeing already some allusions to David and to Saul and to this this struggle between Saul, who is the man of the people. He looks the part. He's tall, handsome, good war fighter. He's got all the things they're looking for. And he's just an utter failure spiritually and otherwise. And then David, who's the last guy you'd think should have the job. But in the strength of the Lord, he is the man after God's own heart. This is the the clear contrast God has created in these two men so that he can teach a story about where strength lies. So to end tonight, in verse 11, we're told that the family returns home, but Samuel stays with Eli. And the story now follows Samuel in this next phase of his life, living in this new home. He'll have brothers who we already talked about. They're going to serve as a contrast to his godliness. And his new father, Eli, is a man with a lot of problems of his own. Uh, But again, remember, this is the time of judges when men did what was right in their own eyes. Furthermore, men are weak leaders in this period of history, uh, as evidenced by uh, women like Deborah stepping forward and and men like uh, Barak and others not able to do what they are called to do. Eli will clearly represent this trend in his own family. He is weak in regard to his own sons. He is uh, not a disciplinarian. And nevertheless, he's now the one the Lord has assigned to raise Samuel. So despite all of that dynamic, I'll kind of cheat and tell you the end. Samuel turns out okay. So we'll get back into the story uh, next time, next week, and uh, continue to press on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that we got started. I pray, Father, you'd give us uh, some new insights in this study as we continue through it in weeks to come, something uh, meaningful for our own walk. Thank you, Father, for the reminder of your sovereignty and for your wisdom, that patience is a part of following you, Lord, but that you don't leave us without encouragement. All of these things, Father, will help us, I know, and I pray that you'd show us where immediately in our life as we walk with you. And I pray, Father, you'd give us a a heart to invite others, perhaps somebody we know who has been uh, depressed or discouraged in things that they're facing, but a word from you would be all they need to to see life differently. I pray, Father, you'd give us someone like that. Maybe we could help. And uh, thank you for the food for those who've attended. Bring us back next week safely. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.